In the sandy, treeless heaths of southern England, mires form part of the landscape. Over the autumn and winter months, shallow pools have collected in the wetter areas of the heath. So far, they're largely unoccupied, but that's about to change. Tonight, the temperature has risen above seven degrees Celsius. Just enough to tempt this green-eyed amphibian out of the sandy burrow where it spent the winter. An unmistakable yellow stripe snaking down a wonderfully warty back marks him as a natterjack toad. The loudest amphibian in Europe. And tonight, he's pitch perfect. By recycling the air stored in his vocal pouch, he can sing continuously without even pausing to exhale. The male with the loudest call wins over the female. So he's hoping his solo will hit just the right note. But despite his best efforts, it seems his neighbors are having all the luck. And he, so far, is not. Having lost the battle here, he goes in hunt of another mate on the other side of the pond. Whereas frogs can hop, Natterjack Toad's little legs are more adapted to a fast crawl. His toxic reputation means predators aren't a concern. Enlarged paratoid glands behind each of his eyes contain a potent poison. And he arrives at his new moonlit spot unscathed. <laughs> His gamble pays off. There's another female here. It's time to go all out to get her attention. His strident song proves irresistible. And he secures his mate. It's a significant success for this vulnerable species. By the next morning, the croaky chorus of the Natterjacks has subsided into silence. Now, where the toads became acquainted, Delicate strings of spawn decorate the surface like jewels. Each string is made up of thousands of eggs. Much smaller and more delicate than that of the common toad, laying so many defenseless eggs may act as a survival strategy. Because they're so shallow, these waters stay warm throughout the spring. This speeds up the development of the Natterjack spawn. And within 10 days, tiny tadpoles are hatching. Now it's a race against time. They must feed quickly, 
and complete their metamorphosis into adult toads before the pond dries up. Yeah, Natterjack toads are pretty peculiar creatures and they have such specific habitat requirements that managing the land for them can be quite tricky. And I'll be finding out a lot more about that here tomorrow. We're going to show you where Yolo is. Yolo is behind us here. He's not behind the gorse bushes, or I hope he's not anyway. He's, he's in the distance there. And if I swam over that bit of water past Brown Sea Island, about 12 miles, I'd eventually reach him. Yolo. I am indeed. 12 miles exactly, I think, Mikael. I think you're spot on there. Now, as you can see, I've left the little sandy cliffs behind me there and I've come down to have a look at the ponds where the Natterjack toads breed. Now, you'll see that there's a fence here, a wired fence, and that is there to keep people and dogs out. But if you have a look down here, you'll see that they've cut little passageways. Those are Natterjack toads highways, allowing them to get from the burrows to the ponds. What I want to know is why do the Natterjack toads use this pond, but not the pond in my back garden? And to answer that, I have a prop and I have an expert. I have Harold Inns from the Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. Howard Inns, sorry, Howard. <laughs> simple question straight away. Why is this pond good for Natterjack toads? OK, simple answer, Yolo, because it's warm and that's what they're after. Natterjack toads need very, very warm ponds to breed successfully, and the shallower they are, like this, that pond will be really warm. So it's exposed to the sun. Problem is, it might dry up. So there is a sweet spot for Natterjacks, and it's round about there, where the pond's shallow enough to stay really warm in, in time for those, those tadpoles to, to get out, to metamorphose, to turn into toads before the pond dries up. And if the pond's deeper, a few things happen. First of all, it gets a bit colder, so the Natterjack toads aren't quite so comfortable in there. And also, it attracts other amphibians. And we know that Natterjack toad tadpoles don't do well, particularly if you've got species like common toad tadpoles in the same pond. And it also increases the number of insect predators. So you get things like dragonfly larvae, you get water beetle larvae, and you get the water boatmen, the back swimmers, that take quite a lot of tadpoles. So the pond needs to dry up, actually, um, but it needs to dry up once the toadlets have, have, have got out. So that, it's a fine balance. That is incredibly niche. It's got to be difficult to manage it to get it just right. It's hugely difficult to manage it to get it just right. They're actually quite a frustrating little beast, even though they're beautiful. Um, and at one time, when they lived in these big dune systems, which are dynamic, so the thing's moving all the time, and the gaps in between the big dune ridges would have filled with water because the water table would have been higher. So they'd have had their choice to select exactly the right types of ponds. Now, when we reintroduced them here in around about 1990, so that's about 25 years ago, um, we decided to put concrete lined ponds in because that would give us the, the right depth, the right warmth to successfully, to allow them to successfully metamorphose and also allows us to keep an eye on the water levels and top up if necessary. So if I was to go and have a look in there now, at what stage in their development are they? Again, that's really interesting because in this pond at the moment, we've got several stages. We've got um, tadpoles from spawn that was laid about four weeks ago, but the first spawning was a couple of weeks before that. And what we've got from that are toadlets starting to emerge. So they're actually around the edge of the pond. So they're starting to come out. And right now, this week, we're starting to see what we believe is a second spawning because females do sometimes come back and spawn a second time. So we're seeing that happen. So we've got spawn in there as well. So we've got several different stages of development uh, in that pond right now. Now, I'm sure you saw Jake Morris's wonderful Natterjack Toad film on Springwatch last night. He also captured some fascinating footage of spinning eggs. Why do they do that? Well, they, he got some great footage, and that, that was fascinating. We've never seen that in Natterjack toads before. And, and those macro shots really brought it to life. That egg is, was about 24 hours old, so it's 24 hours after fertilisation, so at quite an early stage in its development. The embryo is at the top, the yolk is at the bottom. 
and we do know that there are mechanisms inside eggs which get them the right way up and they're caused by tiny little aligned microtubules inside the egg and the action of proteins against those microtubules creates some level of movement but it could also be that the outside of the egg has got tiny hairs on cilia which, which if they're waving in harmony could cause that egg to vibrate but that motorised movement some were going clockwise, some were going anti-clockwise. Amazing to see that. So the jury's still out about exactly what's happening, but, uh, but yeah, amazing to see it. But what that does also is it evens out the warming up that that egg gets. So it makes sense for it to rotate so that each part of the egg warms up at the same rate. So probably aids their development as well. I'll tell you what, I know someone who'll have a view on this, yes. Professor Chris Packham. I'm sure he will. Chris, what do you reckon, small hairs or is it chemicals? Well, Yellow, I've been delving through the literature because we did think this was new to science, but we were wrong because it was actually on April the 28th, 1870, 1870 in the journal Nature, that Dr Schenk reported that it was well known that the embryo of the frog exhibits remarkable movements of rotation. He timed them. He said they rotated in 5 minutes and 13 seconds to 12 minutes and 2 seconds. He was very, very precise. He said that they result from the presence of ciliated cells. So just like Howard said, these are cells with tiny hairs that waft to generate movement. And he confirmed that by the application of moderate heat, which sped the movement up. And then he added the action of weak acids, which are known to operate in the same way on ciliary movements. And that actually slowed them down. So it could be that 150 years ago, Dr. Schenk solved that problem, but we all forgot about it until that film was made just a few weeks ago. And it's amazing to think that that's happening in everybody's ponds, isn't it? And Absolutely. Most incredible. of us have never noticed it. Brilliant yep. stuff.